Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, it is uh, our distinct honor to introduce Dr. Messe, uh, Stephen, Dr. Stephen Messe, a prominent figure in the field of vascular neurology, uh, as our guest speaker for today's Grand Round session. Uh, just to give a brief intro, Dr. Messe is a professor of neurology at University of Pennsylvania, where he also serves as uh, Associate Director of the Vascular Neurology Fellowship Program. Um, Dr. Messe's academic journey started with a, an undergraduate degree from uh, Yale in psychology. He completed his medical degree at University of Michigan. Uh, he then completed his neurology residency as well as uh, Vascular Neurology Fellowship at UPenn where he now serves as a distinguished uh, faculty member. Um, Dr. Messe's substantial research portfolio uh, covers a wide spectrum of topics um, within vascular neurology, which uh, touches upon areas like stroke and PFO management, uh, periprocedural stroke, and hospital strokes, <clears throat> uh, cryptogenic strokes, which we will be hearing uh, more about today, uh, among many other topics. Uh, moreover, uh, Dr. Messe has played a pivotal role in advancing stroke research. Uh, boasting an impressive uh, publication record of over 200 articles and book chapters. Um, his exceptional academic and clinical work uh, has garnered him uh, many awards and accolades uh, globally. Uh, today, we're delighted to have Dr. Messi with us as a guest, uh, sharing his profound insight on the enigmatic topic of uh, cryptogenic strokes. Um, once again, it's a great honor to welcome him to this lecture. Uh, and I personally look forward to uh, the invaluable mentorship you'll be providing during my vascular fellowship uh, training at his institution. Um, Dr. Messe, thank you for being here. Uh, you can continue. All right. Thank you, Johannes. I appreciate that very kind introduction. And I'm also looking forward to having you join us at uh, University of Pennsylvania next year. It's going to be awesome. So good morning, everybody. I thank you for joining. Um, Appreciate the invite to get to speak with you today. And uh, I, I'm gonna be talking about a topic that is controversial. And I think, you know, this is the kind of talk where there's oftentimes a lot of hands get raised and questions and, and uh, interaction and back and forth. So it's not gonna be quite as easy to do that over Zoom. If somebody does wanna raise their hand while I'm speaking, I will do my best to try to see it and, and stop and, and we can talk, but certainly at the end, I'd, I'd love to have some interaction. Um, so let me get the slides to come up here. And put it in slideshow mode. How does that look from uh, your viewpoint? I think you have the presenter's view on. So we're seeing both. Uh slides that's a shame mm. uh all right hold on new share let's try that again uh, is yeah. that any any better yes beautiful thank you johannes helping me out all right so we'll get started Hopefully. All right. Some disclosures. I think the only things that are really relevant here are uh, that I have participated in a number of PFO closure trials as, as a local PI. Uh, I am currently working with Gore in as the on their clinical event committee for their post-marketing study of PFO closure. Um, and I have another study with Gore looking at neurologic outcomes from proximal aortic surgery. And uh I, I like to set the table. This is an important comment to make, particularly when I'm speaking to cardiologists. I don't think they appreciate this nuance whatsoever, but uh, ischemic stroke is not the same as myocardial infarction. Uh, a stroke you know, looks like this on angio. This is what an MI might look like. And obviously it's a blocked vessel. That's, that's nice, but they're really very distinct because stroke is so diverse and so heterogeneous, whereas MI pathophysiologically is relatively homogeneous. Um, most patients just have a ruptured plaque in a coronary artery that leads to an MI, but there's lots and lots and lots of ways to have a stroke, as you all know. Um, TIA, of course, is even more challenging, transient symptoms without any evidence of injury that confirms it's a vascular event uh, is, is particularly challenging because some of these are not actually vascular events. And then 
What's also critically important, and, and we all understand this already, is that if you want to optimally prevent another stroke from happening, you really want to do your best to figure out what happened the first time. And, and this makes perfect sense. If you have a carotid stenosis, a severe carotid stenosis, and a stroke in that distribution, you should fix that carotid. Uh, if you have AFib, we know now you should be anticoagulating those patients who've had a stroke that we think are due to AFib. So, so we, do a, we do a lot of uh, testing. We work hard to figure out what caused the most recent uh, stroke or TIA. When you look at these um, studies that have looked at the different types of causes of stroke, this is the, usually the breakdown that you'll see. About a quarter of them are attributed to cardioembolism, 20% small vessel disease, 20% large artery disease. Uh, but even after a thorough workup, people often say that's about 30% of the time, we, we don't have a definitive answer. We call that a cryptogenic stroke. And then 5%, of course, is this other category, uh, things like hypercoagulability, dissection drugs, uh, sympathomimetic drugs. Um, but there's really the largest category is we're not sure what caused the stroke. So today we're going to talk, I'm going to try to talk about two two subsets of uh, stroke potential stroke etiologies that have been placed under the cryptogenic terminology in the past. Uh, and again, these are both controversial, I think, and, and we don't have all the answers yet, uh, but I think we've made some headway, which is important. So this uh, classic comic book, Tales from the Crypt, here we have the cardiologist and the neurologist supposedly working together to get to the right answer. Um, what is cryptogenic stroke? This is also a problem, it's just the terminology has evolved. Uh, usually what it means is that we haven't finished the workup, and, and I think it's important that you got to finish the workup. But uh, if you've had a thorough workup and it's negative, I think that is the correct term for cryptogenic stroke. In the past, sometimes people have said, well, if you have two etiologies, you have AFib uh, and you have a carotid stenosis in that distribution, which one caused the stroke? That would, we're not sure, so it's cryptogenic. And then sometimes we're just, maybe it's a medium risk cause. We're not exactly sure it doesn't fit any of these categories and we'll put that in under cryptogenic as well, um, which PFO has certainly been in that category. So as an example, this is a 68 year old gentleman who presented just with mild right arm weakness, distal arm weakness in the hand primarily. Uh, he has vascular risk factors and the imaging shows this very small cortical stroke, which does look like an embolism that got that far out to the cortex. So what do we need to do to work this up? Uh, I think the minimum, and, and I think most places are achieving this, obviously we're gonna examine the patient, talk to them, get their history. Uh, carotid imaging, particularly for anterior circulation strokes, is very important. We're going to do an EKG. They're going to be on telemetry in the hospital, get a transthoracic echocardiogram and some routine blood tests. For this patient, assume all those things were done and were negative. What else do we need to do? Uh, well, intracranial vascular disease is certainly common. We appreciate that now. It's about 10% of strokes uh, and higher in some cohorts. Um, and so you want to get intracranial vascular imaging and full extracranial vascular imaging, I think is also a reasonable thing. And it's obligatory in the posterior circulation. And I, I've seen, you know, many, many patients who come to me as a second opinion in the clinic who had a cerebellar stroke and got carotid ultrasounds. And like, we haven't looked at your verts where the stroke came, might've come from. Uh, prolonged cardiac telemetry monitoring. This is something now that is routine for vascular neurologists. Uh, we're going to talk more about that. Uh, and then consideration of a, a TEE. Um, this, this is something that we used to do sort of first line, you know, before someone left the hospital, if it looked embolic and, and we didn't have an answer, we, we would do a TEE, particularly in uh, younger patients. Um, we are, we're doing it less frequently. The cardiologists don't enjoy doing it for some reason, even though they get paid. Um, but I think the main reason is that we've sort of appreciated that, that occult AFib is, is more common than we thought, and maybe looking for that is easier, and if we can find it, it might give us the answer. We don't need to proceed with a TEE. I added here a bubble study. We're going to talk about PFO a little bit more, and certainly under patients under 65, I think it's, it's a very good idea to look for a PFO. Uh, and then consideration of other things like hypercoagulability testing, and then, you know, sending out tests for really weird stuff, maybe. Um, all right. I'm going to stop and just bring up this concept of ESIS, the embolic stroke of uncertain source, which this gentleman did have. Um, and this was uh, led by Bob Hart uh, back in 2014. He put together a group of, of experts to come up with a definition of what would be embolic appearing stroke, um, because maybe we could just treat all these patients the same way. If it's an embolism, we should consider maybe uh, anticoagulating them, just like cardioembolism from, from AFib. So what is the definition? If you see an uh, infarct on imaging that's less than one and a half centimeters on CT or up to two centimeters on DWI, on MRI, um, 
and uh, in the distribution of small penetrating cerebral arteries, uh, if it's can be smaller than that, if it's out of the de that distribution, uh, you can't have any extracranial, intracranial severe or hemodynamically significant stenosis. So anything, um, it has to be less than 50% in the distribution of the stroke, uh, or um, if it's greater than that. Um, no major cardiomyopathic source of embolism. So no AFib, nothing seen on echo, and no other specific cause of stroke identified like dissection, hypercoagulability. All, if you rule out all these other things, it becomes embolic stroke of uncertain source. So it has to appear embolic on imaging, and there's no high-risk source like AFib or severe stenosis uh, in the distribution of that stroke. It would be ESIS, and maybe we should be anticoagulating these patients. Uh, there have been now three studies that have unfortunately refuted this, I think, very reasonable concept the first, Navigate ESIS, which was looking at rivaroxaban at a 15 milligram per day dose, not the full anticoagulation you get with uh, a that's been shown to be uh, usable in AFib, uh, which is 20 milligrams. So it's 15 milligrams a day. And they compared it to aspirin in patients that were exactly like that ESIS definition, and they showed uh, no benefit. So the hazard ratio was 1.1, not significantly different between patients given rivaroxaban and those given aspirin. So maybe the problem was the dose they chose for rivaroxaban was bad. And I think it probably is a bad dose because that has a that drug has a relatively short half-life, uh, shorter than apixaban, uh, and it's yet used once a day. So you get a high, you know, high anticoagulation dose that weans off throughout the course of the day until you have nothing. Um, so maybe that was the problem, but the respect ESIS trial, which is using full dose proda uh, dabigatran, Prodaxa, also showed no benefit. And again, same same patient uh, population, hazard ratio 0.85. So at least the point estimate favored Pradaxa, but not significantly uh, and, and no benefit to anticoagulating these patients. So maybe the problem then is that we, we shouldn't be selecting all embolic strokes. You know, if, it, if it's due to um, athero, large vessel athero, that's not hemodynamically significant, but a ruptured plaque Maybe that's better treated with antiplatelet agents, but really cardioembolism is what we're going for here. Um, and so maybe we should look at patients who are at high risk of having clot forming in the left atrium, uh, this atrialopathy concept. So Arcadia was uh, NIH sponsored trial, uh, randomizing patients to apixaban versus aspirin, selecting them based on presence of an atrialopathy, which was defined based on large left atrium on echo, uh, e EKG finding, or NT pro BNP, randomizing them. And uh, that was just announced as being negative. So we tried again. We swung third strike now for ESIS as a concept to anticoagulate with a DOAC, again, showing no benefit. The, the possible issue here is that their entry criteria that defined atrialopathy may have been too liberal to get patients in. The NT pro BNP level, which was, I think, the predominant mechanism that patients had entry into the study was very low. The cutoff was like 250. Um, and maybe it needs to be higher. Maybe it needs to be 500 or 1,000. Uh, and so I think we'll see that maybe in some additional subgroup analysis. We're still waiting on the primary publication to come out. But three three strikes at uh, ESIS and anticoagulation uh, is what we have so far. All right. So back to the distribution of stroke etiologies here. Again, 30% are cryptogenic. So Maybe, maybe this problem is that there's AFib that's going on, and, and these are patients that we need to find the AFib so that we can anticoagulate them. So occult AFib in patients with stroke. Uh, I think there's a lot of biological plausibility to support this idea. Uh, classically, we always say that AFib raises the risk of stroke fivefold over patients who don't have AFib. Uh, most patients who have AFib are having asymptomatic AFib. So 50 to 90% of episodes are asymptomatic. In patients who have symptoms, the ratio of asymptomatic to symptomatic is still 12 to 1. In patients who have known AFib who come in with a stroke, a quarter of them are in normal sinus rhythm when they present to the hospital. Uh, and in patients, um, again, uh, yeah, the 25% of patients, I'm sorry, who have uh, AFib-associated stroke have no known history of AFib. So they come in without a history of AFib. They're having AFib when they have their stroke admission. But in addition to that, patients with known AFib, 50 to 70% of them present in science rhythm. So very common to have AFib that is paroxysmal. Uh, it can definitely cause stroke. And uh, we should maybe be looking for patients who have a stroke and we don't see AFib in the hospital. We need to look more. So these are the studies that have, that have looked at how we should be looking for AFib. 
Uh, David Gladstone in Toronto published this in New England Journal of Medicine, the EMBRACE study, randomly assigning 570 patients who are 55 years or older uh, who had no known history of AFib but a cryptogenic stroke within the past six months. They were given a 30-day event recorder, which was an external worn, externally worn device versus just 24-hour monitoring. Uh, and the, the endpoint was AFib lasting more than 30 seconds at 90 days. And they found 16% of the patients who, who uh, wore the device had AFib uh, at 90 days versus 3% who wore a device for 24 hours. Uh, and 10% and of that, the majority of it was lasting more than two and a half minutes. Um, so, you know, looking for AFib, you can find some AFib. That's, that's certainly worth knowing. And not a small number of patients had AFib. Then the Crystal AF study uh, came out the same year, this uh, same, same issue actually, 441 patients uh, over 40 years of age with cryptogenic stroke within the past three months were ra randomized to an implantable cardiac loop recorder versus routine care. Uh, and their primary endpoint was AFib lasting more than 30 seconds at six months. And again, if you look for AFib, you find AFib. So it was 9% of the patients uh, who had the implantable loop recorder versus 1.4% at six months, hazard ratio over 6.4 uh, likelihood that you're gonna find AFib. If you continue to follow these patients beyond six months, you found even more AFib. And at three years, uh, here you can see it was 30% of the patients who had the loop recorder, they detected some AFib versus 3% of the patients who didn't have a loop recorder. And that number I think is striking uh, that almost a third of the patients are gonna have AFib in the next three years. Uh, however, it's worth noting that uh, as you can see here at the bottom, um, there is a major loss of, of patient follow-up. Very few patients followed after three years. So I think the precision of that estimate is, is very poor for sure. Uh, that was followed, uh, again, sponsored by the same company, Medtronic, uh, by a study called the Stroke AF Trial. And so what they were thinking is, well, for finding a lot of AFib in patients with cryptogenic stroke, I, I bet old patients who have any kind of stroke also have AFib. And so these were specifically patients who had another cause of their stroke uh, suspected. They had to have either a small vessel appearing stroke or large vessel disease a stroke uh, to get into this trial. And again, they're randomized to getting an implantable loop recorder or just routine care. And they found AFib. It's amazing. Every time you look, you find it. Uh, so at, at 12 months, uh, it was 12% versus 2%. And what I think was particularly striking is you put these two um, survival curves next to each other is that they're literally identical uh, between the stroke AF trial and crystal AF. Crystal AF, again, is cryptogenic stroke. You know, we're worried about maybe AFib cause the stroke versus stroke AF, where we have another very reasonable etiology identified, and you look for AFib, you're going to find AFib the same amount between these two cohorts. It makes you wonder a little bit, um, and I'm going to get back to my conclusion on, on that in a second. I, I just want to mention this meta-analysis of cardiac monitoring after stroke included eight studies, five of them randomized control trials, three observational, about 3,000 patients. Uh, when you look for AFib, you find AFib. That's not surprising. Relative risk increases by almost fourfold. Uh, you start blood thinning medicine and medicine, it, medications. It, it changes your management. So you are twice as likely to start anticoagulant in patients who got monitored. Um, what I think is important is this last line here is that cardiac monitoring in the randomized control trials did not show a reduction in stroke risk. So we're doing this intervention that is has a cost, has uh, inconvenience factors for patients. It's it can be you know annoying at the very least, uh, and and very difficult to wear the devices and to have an implanted device. Uh, the cost is is real, and yet we we didn't show any clear reduction in risk of stroke in the randomized trials. The observational trials, the relative risk was low, it was 0 0.29. It suggested we were really preventing stroke, but the randomized control trial, which should give us our, our most valid estimate of, of effect, um, you know, did not. The point estimate favored monitoring, but not significantly. And then this post hoc analysis of the LOOP study. The LOOP study was done in Scandinavia. They randomized patients to implant a LOOP recorder or not. These were not all stroke patients. So the, the primary trial was sort of all comers, 6,000 patients over 70 years of age, just looking at an aged population. Uh, but this analysis was on the 1,000 patients who had had a prior stroke. So this is the, the kind of patients we're talking about. If you've had a prior stroke, if you put in a loop recorder, does it matter? And it didn't matter. It didn't show reduction in stroke risk in this trial either. The hazard ratio did favor 
uh, implanting loop recorder 0.58, but not statistically significant. And if you looked at severe stroke, there was not even a suggestion of benefit for implanting loop recorder. So, so we're really lacking that conclusive evidence that if we look harder for AFib, we're actually improving outcomes for patients, um, whether it's cryptogenic stroke or not. So if AFib detection rates for cryptogenic stroke are the same as non-cryptogenic stroke, uh, you could conclude we should just monitor everybody because AFib is, is highly prevalent in, in stroke population and it, it's potentially meaningful. Um, on the other hand, you know, if we're talking about an attributable risk, like how, how much did the AFib cause the stroke and therefore need to be treated, uh, it's, the answer is, seems to be zero. You know, the AFib rate is the same in each group, so you can't say that, um, that it's likely to have caused the stroke. And uh, Luciano Sposato uh, up in Canada, a great guy, he, he's been putting forth this concept of, of stroke after, or sorry, AFib detection after stroke. Uh, and, and he's made some really strong points that it seems to be different than AFib identified before a stroke happens. If you know someone has AFib before they, and then they have a stroke. So patients who have AFib detected after stroke, they have a lower CHAS-VASC score. So we know that's a marker for risk of stroke in patients with AFib. They have fewer cardiovascular comorbid conditions, smaller left atrium, a lower burden of AFib, uh, and a lower risk of stroke than patients who have AFib before their stroke. Um, so, so that's important. And this just got published like two weeks ago in Lancet Neurology. A, um, a, he kind of tries to put all this together as a concept. And I think this figure is helpful to understand what we're talking about. Uh, this, this A category here um, are patients who have AFib known before the stroke, right? Lots of, they're having AFib before the stroke. They have their stroke. They have lots of AFib after the stroke. Um, so early AFib with a high burden uh, of, of the AFib. And then there's this category where you don't know they have AFib, and then the line in the middle here is when they have the stroke. But as you look for AFib, you see a high burden afterwards. And probably these patients had AFib before the stroke too. We just didn't know about it because they were asymptomatic. But this high burden of AFib is, is meaningful, and we know these patients are high risk for stroke recurrence. In the B and C categories, these are, are low burdens of AFib. Uh, B is that you look for AFib and you find it a year later, six months later, and it's really a low burden. You get these like 60 seconds of AFib at a time. Um, or you might see some of these patients who have some AFib in the hospital uh, or shortly after being in the hospital, but again, a very brief amount of AFib, 30 seconds of AFib. And then they don't really seem to have much more. And this latter category, the C category, is thought to be maybe caused by the neurocardiogenic syndrome. So some patients with stroke, particularly if it's involving the insula, seem to have cardiac arrhythmias more. They're, they have uh, that kind of irritability that leads to AFib. And they don't necessarily have a long-term risk of AFib. And this B and C category is probably a low risk for stroke recurrence. And it, it raises the question whether we should be looking at all because it's not clear they benefit from anticoagulation. And I think the Arcadia trial um, and all of the meta-analyses and, and the trials that have looked randomized patients for looking for AFib or not um, really do support this concept. So um, you know, what do we know about this? So prolonged monitoring clearly identifies AFib more than no monitoring or even brief monitoring. The more you monitor, the more you find. Uh, however, we at this point really lack evidence that it's clinically beneficial for patients, that we're reducing their recurrent stroke risk uh, by looking for AFib and then anticoagulating them. Um, so who should be monitored now? Should we do all strokes or just cryptogenic strokes? The current guidelines support cardiac rhythm monitoring for patients with cryptogenic stroke. And that's where I'm at. Uh, I don't put in loop recorders in patients with large vessel disease or small vessel disease unless I have a very specific reason to do so. Um, you know, they they have a giant left atrium. They're having arrhythmia. They're having palpitations. Um, something that suggests that they really are having AFib. But I do not do it uh, at all in in all comers with known stroke cause. Um, what type of monitor, external or uh, implantable? So a worn device or, or an implanted loop recorder. Um, I think you know there are certainly sites that are implanting loop recorders in everybody, um, and and I don't do that. We don't do that at Penn. Uh, we tend to start with an external loop recorder and try to get 30 days. And and I think the data supports that. If you're finding a lot of of AFib in that first 30 days, those are the patients that are probably going to benefit from from anticoagulation. That's those patients maybe who didn't have known AFib but clearly had probably had it before the stroke and we just didn't know about it. Um, 
So, so that's what we'll start with. However, I do use a fair amount of the implanted loop recorders nonetheless, because patients sometimes don't tolerate wearing the device. It is a pain in the ass. It does cause skin irritation. It can be very challenging. Um, you know, older people can't figure out all the things that you got to do to wear that device. So having the implanted device is certainly convenient. Um, other times I might do it if a patient has a lot of atrial irritability, high PAC and PVC burden, like more than two or 3%, those patients are thought to have AFib, um, very large left atrium, high, high NT pro BMP. I mean, other signals that suggest to me that these patients might have AFib, I, I will move from the external recorder, even if it's negative to an implantable device. And, and it's true, you know, I, we monitor for at least 28 days. And I think the number of patients that actually get to 28 days of monitoring is, is probably 40% or 30%. Most patients just don't tolerate it that well. So who should receive anticoagulation if AFib is identified? How much AFib do you need to see before you anticoagulate somebody? Sorry. Um, and again, this this is just one of those unanswered questions right now. We we don't know, but the, the, the Arcadia trial being negative, um, I think really makes you pause. Uh, and, and again, the lack of a benefit from monitoring overall makes you pause that I think these really brief episodes of AFib it's not clear they benefit from, from anticoagulation. I think certainly more than an hour or two a day uh, is definitely going to benefit. But, you know, six minutes a day, uh, an hour a week, uh, probably, you know, I think there's going to require a lot of personal, um, you know, direct uh, decision making and shared decision making with the patient. And this is from the Luciano Sposato paper in Lancet Neurology just a couple of weeks ago. And, and this is what they're proposing is that you really need to look at all these other factors that, that I already brought up. So the biomarkers like NT pro BMP, uh, your left atrial size, uh, older patients, females are more likely to uh, have stroke from AFib uh, by a little bit. And then other risk factors like uh, hypertension, diabetes, and heart failure, your, your, your typical Chad's VASC type approach. Um, and perhaps we can find these patients that are really highest risk uh, from AFib, from transient proxismal AFib uh, that will benefit from anticoagulation. But right now we, we don't know what these thresholds need to be. All right. Um, so we're back here with the, the distribution of stroke etiologies, and we're going to transition now to talk about PFO patients. Everybody's hanging in there? All right. All right. So when did this story of PFO and stroke begin? It, it's a long time ago now. In 1564, there was Dr. Batalo. He was an Italian surgeon who lived in France, and he was the first reportedly to at least document finding this foramen ovale in the heart, in the atrial septum. And it was for a while called Batalo's foramen. In 1877, Julius Kohnheim, who was a pathologist who worked with Barakow, he was the first to suggest, and I would say very intelligently, uh, that PFO could be a mechanism for stroke. And he had a patient who had a huge, MC, younger patient supposedly who had a large MCA stroke and died. And on pathology, had a, DV, a DVT, had the stroke and, and had Batalo's foramen, the PFO was present. And he posited that this could be a conduit for paradoxical embolization leading to cerebral ischemia. So way back in 1877, way ahead of the curve, Conheim proposed that as a stroke etiology. So what is a PFO? A PFO uh, is a failure of a sealing of that foramen that is present in all of us as we're developing in the womb. It is an obligate uh, part of the fetal circulation. It allows blood, oxygenated blood with nutrition that's coming from the umbilical vein uh, to the right side of the heart to cross to the left side of the heart and, and circumvent the lungs, which are doing nothing in the baby besides soaking in, in liquid. So um, with our high resistance. So it gets to the left side of the heart and then out to the body. Autopsy studies in adults suggest that the prevalence ranges from 17 to 29%. Interestingly, the PFO incidence seems to go down with age. Uh, which I think I think was interesting. Some have suggested that because PFO is a risk for dying early, uh, I think that's possible. I don't love that idea, uh, but it's possible. And then the other option is just that as time goes on, more of the PFOs seal, which I think is also a very plausible explanation for that finding. Um, and then if you look in vivo, uh, you'll find it about a quarter of the time in adults. So TEE studies, bubble studies in TEE, in a population-based study out, out in uh, Minnesota at Mayo, found one in four patients had a PFO by TEE. 
This is what a PFO looks like on a TEE. I'm going to, can you guys see my pointer or is that just me uh, for myself pointing at things? Johannes, how am I, I doing? I don't see it. We don't see the pointer. Huh. Well, I'm going to try some annotating here. Let's see if this works. Can you see anything? Did I point with the mouse? It says no. I'm clicking on it. Uh, maybe not. Well, all right. I'm going to describe, I'm going to paint a picture with my words here. In the bottom left corner of the screen, there's an opacity. Everybody can see that. That is the right atrium that has filled with agitated saline bubbles. So they're not allowing the echo to, to be seen. Now look above that is the left atrium. Boom. You can see it all squirting through there on TEE. So clearly a PFO. And what's important to know is this is not a hole in the heart uh, like an ASD. This is a flap and a tunnel, basically, that, that pinches closed. You can do that one more time. Again, right atrium, opacified. You'll see the bubble squirt through up top to the left atrium. All right. Now, atrial septal aneurysm is also part of the story. Um, this is described as excessive septal wall motion. Basically, the septal wall between the left and right atrium is longer than it needs to be, so it's excessive, and it can bend in and out uh, of the two sides, the two atria. The definition of what's an atrial septal aneurysm varies from study to study, somewhere between one to one and a half centimeters. Uh, it may occur alone, but most often it's seen with a PFO, and, and over three quarters of of cases up to 80% of the time, you will see a right to left shunt. And when you do, actually it's associated with greater shunting. I think it's important to note, uh, not as common as PFO seen in about 2% of patients on TE. And this is a great example of the atrial septal aneurysm on TE. I won't have to use the pointer because it's so obvious. It's like jumping rope, right? Back and forth between the atria. So thanks to Frank Silvestri uh, here for providing these nice illustrative images. Now, PFO, uh, going back into the mid-late 80s, case control studies suggest that you are more likely to find a PFO in a young patient with stroke, uh, particularly a young patient with stroke without another etiology, you find PFO more commonly than, than in other stroke causes or in older patients. So uh, odds ratio was three over threefold, you're going to find a PFO in patients under 55 years of age. Uh, back in 2014, this, this meta-analysis published in Neurology. Um, how does it cause stroke? Uh, paradoxical embolism, as Julius Conheim suggested, probably that's the most common reason it's causing stroke. When you look for a venous th uh, thrombus, it looked for a place where the clot may have come from, it, you don't find it very often, and the studies vary anywhere between 2 to 20 percent. Uh, personally, I don't look for a DVT in every single patient, but if there's anything suggestive of the story, they were immobilized, they were dehydrated, there's leg pain, leg swelling, um, a high D-dimer. I, I do look in those cases, but I, I don't do it out of um, course in every single patient where I think the PFO may have caused the stroke, but it's most. Um, and then just some really conclusive, I think really suggestive studies of this. There's been now a number of these, but uh, patients who come in with pulmonary embolism who then get an MRI and a TEE with bubble study, all patients, they come in just, the inclusion criteria is just that you come in with a, an acute PE. And what they find is that uh, PFO is seen in about a quarter of them. It was 25% of the patients in this study had a PFO, as you'd expect, in the adult population. They saw infarct on MRI in a, in a third of the patients with PFO and only one of the patients, 22% of the patients without a PFO. Who may That patient may have been hypercoagulable. But clearly, if you have a PFO and you have a PE, some of that clot can get through the PFO and, and have a paradoxical embolism. This is a classic long old uh, image in medicine, published in New England Journal of Medicine, 1997. It, it's a saddle embolus sitting uh, through the PFO that was trapped in the PFO, and then they pulled it out. It's, it's disgusting, but uh, impressive. Now, an important notion here, PFO is really common in adults, and uh, we're not all having strokes all the time. It's a low, I think it's a, it's a low risk for stroke. And it's a low risk for stroke occurrence, even if you've had a stroke that we think was caused by the PFO. And this meta-analysis um, back in 2009 of patients with PFO who were treated medically, vast majority of that was aspirin, uh, the risk of recurrent stroke was about one and a half percent per year, which is a very low rate of stroke compared to other patients who've already had a stroke. There've been now six randomized uh, trials of PFO closure 
going back, starting in the early 2000s. I think important notes here are that all of these trials took forever to finish. And um, there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, I think one of, the, one of the reasons is that it's just hard to get patients to consent to a randomized trial of an intervention versus medical therapy. Patients like to be in control of their own body and making decisions about when they're gonna get a procedure and leaving it up to random fate is hard mentally for them to accept. So, so convincing patients to randomize in these trials is, is hard no matter what. Uh, but that said, the problem also was that there are non-PFO um, devices, so atrial septal closure devices that were available, and also the PFO closure devices for, for a time were also available as a humanitarian device exemption. And patients could get their PFO closed outside of the trial uh, during much of this time. And so uh, I really think that hindered us getting to the right answer, but we finally did. So overarching concerns about these trials, I'm going to start with that. Uh, as I said, slow enrollment, um, pay, we didn't do blinded trials. So we didn't fake, uh, an, fake a procedure for patients. So they didn't know if they got it or not. Patients knew what they were treated with. Their treating clinicians knew what they were treated with. Um, some of them had a blinded endpoint ascertainment, uh, and most of them had adjudication that was blinded. And that's very important. But uh, defense PFO trial didn't appear to have blinded adjudication. They didn't mention it in their description of the trial. And, and these are real concerns that could bias the results of the study. Uh, for all of these trials, there was a high loss to follow up, partially because they went on so long. Uh, and there was a lot of crossover. So you'd get randomized to one arm and you wouldn't want to do what, what you were supposed to do. So you'd cross over, either not get closed if you're randomized closure, but much more commonly it was patients randomized to medical therapy who were convinced they needed to get their PFO closed. And then because PFO is a low risk for stroke, there were low event rates. It was not a surprise that that was going to be an issue. And I'm just presenting, I'm not going through each trial individually. It's too painful. Uh, here's the summary of each of the trials. The uh, closure one trial published in 2012 was, was strongly neutral or negative, uh, showing no benefit. Two trials of the Amplaster device published um, uh, initially both in 2013. The second uh, additional follow-up for the for the RESPECT study in 2017 with additional follow-up uh, suggested a benefit. There was a trend towards benefit of closure, but not uh, statistically significant on their own until they were followed for longer in the RESPECT trial. And then most recently in 2017 and 2018, these three <laughs> trials, the, me. the, um, the uh, GORE uh, reduced PFO closure trial, the closed trial done in France, and then uh, defense PFO from Korea. When you do a meta-analysis of all, all of these trials, you see a benefit of stroke risk reduction uh, on the order of about 0.7% per year. Uh, that is certainly not a large number, but it's also worth noting that these are young patients and the time horizon is not you know, it's not one year and it's not even five years. We're talking maybe 20 years, five, 25 years, 30 years. Um, so if you look at a, a five-year time horizon as a very short one, I think in this population, you're reducing the risk of stroke by about three and a half percent at five years, which is, which is potentially, I think, very clinically meaningful. Another thing just to sort of note here, over time, you see this trend where the studies were initially negative and then they became positive. So why is that? Uh, I think Importantly, we selected patients more carefully. I think in these latter trials, they used, uh, for example, in the, in the French trial, you had to have what we thought would be a high-risk PFO, an atrial septal aneurysm or a large shunt. That was true also for the defense PFO trial um, and, and predominantly true in the patients that were enrolled in the, the REDUCE study. Um, and I think off-label closure was much reduced, much much less common in these latter trials because of the neg negative and early trials. So I think I think those things are really the key: is that we we didn't exclude the patients who were most likely to benefit, and we really selected the ones to we enrolled the ones that were most likely to benefit as well. All right. So the meta analysis um, of these trials, looking at adverse events, what's the downside of PFO closure? There is paraprocedural complication rate of almost four percent. Most of these were not life-threatening or uh, have any long-term repercussions, um, but non-periprocedural AFib was increased by putting these devices in the heart. It's not a surprise. And this, this is excluding the periprocedural period. So in the first 30 days, the risk of AFib is actually uh, you know, not, not, not minor. It's probably on the order of um, you know, 8% or so, but this is beyond that early period. You do increase the risk of AFib long-term, and it, it's about 0.36% per year, 0.4% per year. 
Um, some people have suggested, well, why should we close a PFO, which is low risk for stroke, and, and replace it with a risk of AFib, which is high risk for stroke, although we've already shown some evidence that not all AFib is clearly a, a high risk. Um, the answer is, you know, the bottom line is the study showed reduction in stroke risk, and some patients do end up anticoagulated and permanently so, um, which is a downside. I think that's real, but, um, you know, clearly we're, we're preventing more strokes than we're causing. For subgroups, you know, who's most likely to benefit? Again, this is a meta-analysis of all the closure trials. If you look at patients under 45 or those 45 to 60, uh, because that was 95% of the patients were under 60 years of age, there's no, no difference. So it didn't seem like as you got older, you were less likely to benefit, which is nice to see. Um, shunt size did matter, and it mattered a lot, actually. Uh, so there was an interaction there for shunt size. Large shunts clearly benefited. Small shunts, maybe not. That didn't clearly show a benefit at all statistically. And there again, this was a significant interaction. At least in, in our, um, this was a, uh, a study level meta-analysis, not a patient level meta-analysis, but atrial septal aneurysm, although the point estimate suggested perhaps the presence of atrial septal aneurysm was more likely to benefit, uh, not a significant interaction. Uh, for antithrombotic use, uh, antiplatelet patients who were randomized and given antiplatelet agents um, versus you know, getting closure with an antiplatelet agent or just taking an antiplatelet agent, closure was better than taking aspirin alone. And, and clearly so. Uh, if you were given anticoagulation, it wasn't clear that there was a benefit of PFO closure, but this interaction is not significant. So, you know, don't think too hard on that. But this, I think, is also important. There was interaction for the pattern of injury uh, for the initial index stroke. So if you came in with, with an abolic appearing stroke, clearly you benefited. If it was a small, deep stroke, you were not not clearly going to benefit from PFO closure. All right. So we published this, uh, this guideline. This was the third update to this PFO guideline that was originally published in 2004 uh, that, that really came through finally for the American Academy of Neurology to support the idea of PFO closure. In patients under 60 with PFO, embolic appearing infarct, and no other mechanism, clinicians may recommend closure following discussion of possible benefits such as reduction of stroke occurrence and risks, which include procedural complication and atrial fibrillation. There are other recommendations in this guideline that suggest even if it's a small deep stroke, if you're very young without vascular risk factors and it looks like it could be embolic and you've ruled out anything else that causes small deep strokes in young people, you could consider it. And you could consider patients over 60 as well, where they don't have, again, a tradi you know, traditional vascular risk factors. They're healthy 65 year olds, they have a, a large PFO with an atrial septal aneurysm. Uh, I do think PFO closure is very reasonable in that population as well. <clears throat> and then most recently, and, and I think this paper is incredibly important, um, this patient level meta-analysis published by Dave Kent uh, and, and the group back in JAMA in 2021. So these are now all six randomized PFO closure trials, uh, almost 3,700 3, patients. Uh, they were median age 46, although again, it went up to as high as I think in the 80s from the defense PFO trial. Um, not a huge burden of vascular risk factors, but they did have some. A third had hyperlipidemia, 25% hypertension, and a small number of diabetes. And the point of this analysis was really to look at two, um, two scores that can both determine whether the PFO may have been the cause of the stroke and also whether you're likely to benefit from closure. So the ROPE score was originally put forth by Dave Kent uh, and Dave Thaler um, back, I think, in 2014. Uh, and what they did is they, they took groups, these cohorts of cryptogenic stroke patients, and they looked for predictors of whether a PFO was found or not. Uh, and then they came up with this score uh, that helps you determine whether the PFO maybe caused the stroke. So if PFO is more prevalent than you'd expect in the general population, 25%, um, then maybe that PFO was the cause of the initial stroke. And basically what you're doing here is ruling out traditional vascular risk factors and, and causes of stroke. So if you don't have any history of hypertension, diabetes, or a prior stroke, and this latter point, I think, gets to the fact that PFO is low risk for stroke. So if you're having lots of strokes, it's probably not the PFO. Something else is going on, most likely. Um, if you're not a smoker, and if it's an embolic appearing stroke, you get a point for each of those things. Um, and then if you're young, you get five points. So if you're under 30 years of age, you get five points. And for every decade beyond that point, you subtract a point from that. So if you're a, a 10, that means you're young without vascular risk factors, you've never had a prior stroke, you have an embolic brain stroke. Um, that would suggest then that the PFO is the cause of the stroke and perhaps most you're gonna be a patient that's most likely to benefit. 
Now the Pascal categorization adds on to the rope score. It's using the same rope score, but it adds on the echocardiographic risk factors that are considered to be high risk. And in this in this cohort, they had they had um, captured the shunt size in everybody and whether an atrial septal aneurysm was present in everybody. I want to make the point that they did not capture shunting at rest as a risk factor. Uh, some studies have suggested that if you see shunting continuously, uh, not just when you're doing a Valsalva maneuver, which is two, you know, the bubble study, you usually do it twice, once at rest and once while you're bearing down with a Valsalva, which can change the pressures and pop that PFO open. Um, shunting at rest has been shown to be a risk factor in other, other cohorts, but they weren't able to test it here because they just didn't capture that in all the studies. But looking at large shunt and atrial septal aneurysm as high risk features, um, you put that together with the rope score. And if it's seven or higher, that's the group that was thought to be most likely to benefit from PFO closure. So importantly, if you don't have a high rope score, so it's six or less, you don't have a large shunt or atrial septal aneurysm, you're categorized as the PFO being unlikely to be the cause of your stroke. If you have either a high rope score or a high risk PFO feature, it is possible that the PFO is related to your stroke. And if both are present, it becomes probable. So now how did that work out with benefit for, for stroke prevention from PFO closure? benefit of closure. Looking up here at the top, um, the rope category is less than seven or greater than seven. If you had a, a rope score less than seven, you were less likely to benefit. Possibly you could still benefit though. Um, and on a uh, relative category, um, the hazard ratio, or just looking at the hazard ratio, the likelihood of benefit. Now, if you add Pascal to it, uh, it becomes much more discriminating. So if you're unlikely, meaning you have a low rope score and no high risk echocardiographic features, there seems to be no suggestion of benefit of PFO closure. And again, this the interaction term was strongly significant. If you have possible, you are like very, you're gonna benefit uh, with a hazard ratio of 0.38. Um, so a 62% reduction in stroke risk. And if it's probable, if your rope score is high and your high risk echo finding, uh, the benefit is really profound. It's a 90% reduction in stroke risk. So this, this Pascal categorization is, is really, really helpful. Um, looking at the absolute risk reduction, so actual like percentage of stroke reduced, um, again, for rope scoring, it doesn't seem, you don't seem to get a benefit on an absolute risk reduction for a uh, rope score less than seven alone versus greater than seven. Uh, but looking at the Pascal categorization, unlikely definitely doesn't benefit, or at least no suggestion of benefit with large confidence intervals and both possible and probable had similar absolute risk reductions. So even though, um, you know, I think up here, it's interesting that the, the hazard ratio is clearly better for the probable stroke. The reason why the absolute risk reduction is similar between possible and probable is because the uh, pr probable group has a lower absolute risk of stroke because they're young. And if you're old, you actually have a higher risk of stroke uh, even though you don't get quite as much of a benefit, the absolute reduction is similar. So I tend to just lump possible and probable together. You basically have to have a rope score greater than seven or seven or greater or high risk echocardiographic features. And again, these are all cryptogenic stroke patients. They've had all, all the other etiologies ruled out. Either of those uh, conditions being true, I think you're going to benefit from PFO closure. What's also notable, though, is that the risk of AFib after closure is related to the Pascal categorization. And so if you have, if you're in this unlikely category, your risk of AFib is, is quite high. It's 6% uh, versus 1.6%. Uh, relative risk is 3.7. So not only are you not shown to benefit from PFO closure, but we're also likely to be causing AFib in these patients, probably because they're, they're mostly the older patients. They may also be having, uh, they, they may have AFib as their, their cause of stroke potentially, I think, beforehand. But uh, the bottom line is, um, you know, these patients, I think, are not likely to benefit. And again, that's what's so useful about this paper is that it, even among the patients who went into these trials where we saw benefit, they found the group that, that probably doesn't benefit. We shouldn't be closing them. But everybody else, we should feel really good about. It, and we should be, I think, recommending it, um, you know, appropriately with, with, import, with the uh, important information that patients need to make that decision. All right. Um, actually, I, I had this case, and I guess I, that slide fell out at the beginning, but I had this 54-year-old woman. She had a very mild stroke, embolic appearing on MRI. She did have some vascular risk factors. She was a smoker. She had a mild hyperlipidemia. She happened to be on hormone replacement therapy. Uh, her echo uh, looked okay, um, did show mildly dilated left atrium, and the PFO was shunting at rest. So, you know, what should we do with this patient? 
And the answer is that, you know, we did AFib monitoring. She didn't have AFib. Uh, she definitely was okay stopping her hormone replacement therapy and stopping smoking, which are two obvious risk factors for venous thromboembolism. And we talked about PFO closure because I didn't think it was unreasonable to consider it, but uh, she, she didn't want to do it. And I think given that she had these other very modifiable risk factors with smoking and hormone replacement therapy, I, I didn't push her too hard on it. I think it was a reasonable decision on her part uh, and she's been doing fine. So I think it's also worth noting that PFO uh, is a great opportunity to practice patient-centered healthcare because there's obvious pros and cons of PFO closure with uh, maybe reducing stroke risk with a risk of a procedure and risk of AFib, um, albeit you know small risks. Uh, you get to have that discussion with the patients. Uh, and I, I think it's really a good way to have a good relationship with patients. It does take time. It can be challenging in that way. But in the end, I think making the patients aware of all information we have, and we have a lot more now, and empowering them to uh, you know, make the decision that's best for them, I think is, is, a, is a great thing to do as a doctor. So to conclude, PFO is common. Uh, it's not a high-risk stroke mechanism. Um, closure benefits select patients. Deciding upon closure is generally not a stat issue. You know, I, I've seen plenty of patients get closed while they're in the hospital with their index stroke, and I don't think that is necessarily appropriate. I think they need to complete the workup, uh, potentially getting AFib monitoring in the, in the right population. Um, and if you find an alternative high-risk etiology, that's probably going to be the cause and not the PFO. And all of these studies I just showed you with the Pascal uh, categorization being helpful, that was, again, in cryptogenic stroke patients. That The patients in the trials were almost all under 60, and they all had a very thorough workup for other causes of stroke. <clears throat> so it reduces stroke risk in patients with possible or probable PFO-associated stroke per Pascal, which mostly are patients under 60, no other cause, embolic appearing. Uh, in other patients with PFO, the benefit of closure is not as clear. Uh, there are plenty of patients that we see that were not would not have been eligible for the trials, um, and clearly, again, there are patients in this unlikely category of Pascal that didn't benefit from closure. So who shouldn't be closed? I, I've had this question asked to me many times. If a PFO was found incidentally, should I close it? My answer is always no. Uh, for primary prevention, they've never had a stroke or a TIA. Um, I have had, just to say a second, I, I have had patients who are found to have an embolic appearing stroke that is chronic appearing on MRI that was found incidentally um, and some of them, you know, when I ask them about symptoms, they tell me, oh, yeah, you know, five years ago or so, I had this episode where my arm became weak, uh, and I, you know, they, I, they didn't know what it was. They already had a pinched nerve, you know, and, and it, the, the stroke fits that, that, that distribution. That probably was a stroke, and, and I've talked to them about closure. But again, it becomes less, I think, less um, clear that they should be closed, even in that setting. All right. Uh, if there's an alternative mechanism present that's clearly higher risk than PFO, the age thing is a real challenge. Um, you know, at what age should you say, no, I would not consider PFO closure. And for me, it's in the 65 to 70 range, but I have met 69 year olds who look amazing, incredibly healthy people uh, who have a high risk PFO. And, and I'm comfortable recommending closure that they consider closure. But again, it becomes, uh, I think, less strong of a recommendation. Um, whoops, that went out of order. Pe people with this small shunt, absent atrial, se atrial septal aneurysm, and rope less than seven, that's the unlikely category for Pascal. If they, it is small vessel appearing and they have risk factors for small vessel disease, it's probably small vessel disease. Uh, and then this is a real challenge also. Those patients who require anticoagulation for some other reason, maybe they've had an unprovoked DVT, uh, and then they have a stroke um, due to PFO. Wow, we got way ahead. I don't know what happened there. Uh, I, I, I generally don't recommend closure in that those patients who require anticoagulation, but I do discuss it with them. And, and I, you know, I think they can consider it and I would send them to the cardiologist to have a discussion with them as well. But for me, I'm not at all convinced that uh, closure on top of anticoagulation is providing benefit for patients. All right. So back to the distribution of stroke uh, causes, 30% are thought to be cryptogenic. I think probably about 5% of these are, are PFO attributable and another 5% are are due to AFib, like meaningful amounts of AFib. Uh, so we can get the cryptogenic stroke population down, maybe down to 20% uh, nowadays. I think that's that's plausible. So thank you. I appreciate, again, uh, the, t the time that you spent with me, and I'm really happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Messe, um, for this comprehensive uh, review. We do have some a number of questions in the chat box, so I'll just be reading out some of them. Great. Uh, 
and then whoever has questions, they can unmute and uh, uh, ask away. So the first question is kind of a philosoph philosophical question from Bill. Um, uh, he asks, uh, why do patients sometimes do better on observational studies than randomized ones, um, uh, presumably due to the use of physician judgment or uh, in real life, uh, we don't simply flip a coin uh, to decide whether to treat or not. If you have any comments on that, no, I, I think I think you nailed it. I think it's just that it it does provide some evidence that we're we're decent at our job. At least you know we can maybe pick the right treatment for our patients more often than than a random flip of a coin. Uh, so th so there's a lot of confounding right in those studies, and and it makes it hard to know for sure. Um, that if we take all patients, that we should be doing the same thing. Um, and so I, I do think randomized trials are, are really important and they, they do get at probably the right answer. There's obvious huge problems with randomized trials too, um, because it doesn't necessarily reflect on all the population that you do see, right? The uh, external validity of these studies are always challenging. Um, they cost a lot of money. They're always slow. Uh, so so there, there's a downside to that, but I, I do think that it's helpful. And for these PFO closure um, randomized trials that I wish we'd gotten done a lot faster, you know, to get to this answer, I think it would have been really beneficial and positive. Uh, next question is from Dr. Suman Ghosh. Um, he, he asks regarding the TCD use, uh, does TCD bubble studies affect the Pascal category or does it factor it in? That's a, that's a great question. And I just had a bunch of email debates with a bunch of cardiologists that are uh, want to talk about more about TCD bubble studies. I, I think it's very helpful. So a TCD bubble study is at least as sensitive as TEE for defining right to left shunt. Um, so I think as a screening tool, it can be very helpful. I, you know, obviously it's measuring the end organ that you care about uh, for the emboli, which is great. The problem with it is you can't just do a TCD bubble study and say, well, therefore it's a PFO. You can't even say it's a cardiac shunt, right? Like you still need to pair that with the echo visualization of the atrial septum to make sure it's not an ASD, to make sure it's not a pulmonary shunt. Um, you know, I, I really think that's important. So uh, I do think it's useful. I, the other thing is that it's limited in, you know, availability. So we don't offer TC bubble studies at Penn. We, we can do it in a research setting and, and we've done it for studies, but we don't do it clinically. Um, and I think that's true for many, many, many sites. It's just not available. Um, and so... You know, I, I don't think it's obligatory that we do it, but it is sensitive. It does measure emboli to the brain. And I think pairing that with imaging of the heart uh, can be helpful for probably choosing who can be uh, going into go, going for PFO closure or not. So, yeah, I think if you see a large shunt on TCD uh, and you see the PFO and, you know, all other signs point to PFO closure. Yeah, I think that's helpful. Um, the next question is, how long do you recommend to a cardiac monitor before referral to a PFO closure? Another great question. Again, I, I didn't get even into all of these um, controversies. So for me, and again, this is my practice. Uh, if you're over 40, I will do a 30-day MCOT, you know, 30-day uh, external loop recorder um, before recommending closure. In some patients where I'm concerned about AFib, you know, an implanted loop recorder is great before for closure, because then you have that protection afterwards. If there is AFib, it's going to identify it, which is nice. Um, but anyway, yeah. So if you're over 40, I will definitely do a 30-day monitor. I, under 40, I will only do it if there is some suggestion, something. Um, the echo shows cardiac cor, uh, cardiac abnormality, the nt pro BMP is elevated, the EKG is abnormal, something else that points to that the heart is not normal. I would do, again, a 30-day monitor. But most patients under 40 don't have that. And we do have two questions from Dr. Papa Misakis. Um, the first one: Do you recommend to uh, PFO for PFO closure in migraineurs? Um, I definitely don't, uh, and it's not to say that it might not help. I, you know, th there have been two, two or three randomized studies with Prima and Premium or randomized trials of PFO closure for migraine treatment, and unfortunately, the way those trials were planned, they, they, I think an unrealistic primary endpoint was like eradication of all migraine, like nothing's going to do that. Um, so they were negative. They were clearly negative. If you look at the secondary endpoints for like migraine days um, and you and you do a meta-analysis of the trials, it does suggest that you reduce maybe the frequency of migraines in, in a potentially meaningful way. But um, I first of all, I don't take care of a lot of migraineurs, thank God. <laughs> I try to get them to the headache clinic. Um, 
but I, I don't think, uh, I, I, you know, there's a lot of other treatments that are now available. And so I, I don't, I wouldn't tell a patient to get their PFO closed for migraine. I would love to see another randomized trial with a reasonable endpoint um, and maybe better patient selection. There, there are some, some thought that if you respond to an antiplatelet um, and you're a, migrant, a migraineur with aura, that you're the ones who are the PFO is more likely to be the cause or, or contribute to the migraine. And so those are the patients should be closed. So there is, I think, a trial that is either starting or ongoing, looking at your response to antiplatelet treatment and then randomization for PFO closure. And that would be awesome. But right now I don't do it. His next question is, uh, do you recommend loop and uh, lacunar strokes with SVD risk factors or? No, no, that was the, yeah, that's that stroke AF trial um, that suggests small vessel disease stroke. Those patients have a, a high rate of AFib, similar to what we saw in the crystal AF trial. And for me, I'm, you know, and, and I agree with Luciano Spazzato that, you know, probably we're finding incidental AFib, small amounts of AFib that is of unclear clinical significance at this point. We have no evidence that it's beneficial to, to monitor those patients. But I will also note that I'm, I, I think this is controversial and there are plenty of people who will do that. Um, but I, I just, the, the cost, you know, in, and just doesn't seem worth it to me at this point until I have better evidence that it's helpful. Oh, I guess I have one question. Uh, oh, Dr. Gary, go ahead, you can unmute. Uh, good morning, Dr. Messi, for a great um, presentation. And you have a famous name. And uh, the soccer player, I assume you're not, you're not talking about me. <laughs> but, the, but with your name, not realizing it is E and not I. That's right. It's Lionel. Okay. Yes. But I, I, I'm I, a PD, PD neurologist. And yesterday we were discussing on neonatal stroke, which mm -hmm. is again a very important topic for us. Yes. And again, in the discussion, I was pointing out that PFO plays a very important role in, you know, the emb emboli, the embolic uh, arterial stroke. And rightfully, my adult resident said, but, you know, there's so much controversy in adult. I said, yes, we're talking about two different, you know, age groups. And so, yes, you know, I'm saying what is important at, at uh, neonatal is not necessarily later in life. But again, we wonder what it's doing because clearly there is a conduit that is going to send emboli up. But yeah. thank you very much. No, thank you for making that point. I think it's a really interesting question. In general, for a pediatric stroke, um, you know, if you see a PFO, should you do anything <laughs> about it? And if it's neonatal, I, I don't, I, I wouldn't go anywhere personally. I, I just don't know enough. I wouldn't go there. But what I think is really challenging is what when you have a teenager, uh, who has a stroke and, and has a large PFO and you don't find any other mechanism for their stroke, you know, should you consider closure in those patients? And I've had debates with pediatric neurologists and I, I got reprimanded by Heather Fullerton, who's, you know, a well-known pediatric stroke neurologist, because I suggested that, you know, if you're a 16 year old uh, and you have a, a large shunt and an atrial septal aneurysm and no other stroke mechanism, why is that different than a 19 year old? You know, I, I personally think I would consider a closure in that patient. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say you absolutely have to do it, but I think that the, the family and the patient should hear about the data. And I think it would be reasonable to consider closing a 16 year old who has a large shunt and atrial septal aneurysm uh, and an embolic brain stroke and no other mechanism identified. The problem, you know, with the Pascal categorization and younger in the pediatric population is that the rope score is meaningless because everybody's rope score is is in the you know in the likely to benefit um, category. It's all it's all seven or greater, so you can only rely on the echocardiographic findings to maybe select patients. But I, I again, I think it's reasonable. She she pointed out that well, we don't know the safety of these having these devices in your heart your whole life, and I absolutely concede that point. And clearly, there's a small risk of late complication where there can be erosion of the device, um, and perhaps it increases the risk of AFib occurring, you know, in their 40s as opposed to in their 70s. That is all I think a, a fair point. But if you're reducing your risk of stroke by a half a percent per year, and this is a 16 year old, by the time they're 40, you you've had a huge impact on the stroke risk. So Great question, controversial topic. I've gotten yelled at by pediatric neurologists many times now. <laughs> I I don't think pediatric neurologists should be in the business of yelling, but discuss. no, no, they're they're all incredibly kind, way nicer than adult <laughs> neurologists. Right. That's true. I, I didn't mean to imply that. No, but thank you so much because again, this is what makes life 
you know, challenging for all of us. Absolutely. I agree. Um, I have uh, one question going back to the studies that you presented, especially the Arcadia and the one preceding uh, that study. Um, it almost sounds like counterintuitive that we're detecting AFib uh, at such a high rate. If we look for it maybe for two years or three years and anticoagulation seems to be not helping. Uh, has anybody looked at this subset of uh, patients, maybe a post-hoc analysis and recurrent cryptogenic stroke? Uh, if a patient comes in with embolic appearing stroke and we find no ideology for embolism and uh, if they come back again uh, with another stroke, say six months out, uh, would that be clinically justified to empirically anticoagulate? Maybe some post hoc analysis of the data uh, if something is out there. I think that's a great question. Uh, I've thought about we thought about that as well. I I don't know of that. I have to say we're um I'm working with a junior faculty here named Aaron Rothstein who's trying to do a, a meta analysis of studies of of any study that compares aspirin to to a comparator intervention, whether it's another antiplatelet or anticoagulation, and looking at patients who had uh, been taking an aspirin at the time of their index stroke and whether it was worth then changing to a different uh, antithrombotic. So we're not done collecting all that data, but it's going to be, I think, interesting. Um, and anecdote, I mean, just for my own practice, uh, my rule, and I teach this to the to the fellows and, and residents, is like, I, I don't like patients to be on the same medicine they were on when they had their stroke. I, I think that's psychologically upsetting for myself and definitely for the patient. I feel like, you know, they need psychologically to be on something different to know, to have hope that they're not going to have another stroke, uh, even if it's not clearly going to be different. Um, so yeah, I, I think if somebody has a second stroke and clearly are taking their medicine, I think that's one of the questions you really got to have a, you know, look them in the eye and ask for a heart to heart about like, were you missing doses, particularly medicines like Xarelto, which the half-life is, is, you know, again, relatively short. Um, but if they, they, they're taking their medicine and they have another stroke, I'm going to switch them to something else. And, uh, I do use the, the compass trial protocol, which is like low dose Sorelto twice a day plus aspirin in patients with atherosclerotic disease. Uh, and anecdotally, again, just in my patient populations, I've, I, I feel like I've had good success. They haven't had bleeding complications. They haven't been coming back in with more strokes. But I will also definitely just go right to Eliquis uh, if somebody clearly had a stroke or more than one event on an antiplatelet. Uh, empiric anticoagulation is okay in my book. Uh, if they have failed antiplatelets and it appears embolic, and you're not sure where it's coming from. They may be hypercoagulable in a way that we can't characterize. Uh, you know, I, I feel good about anticoagulating those patients empirically. We get to make some clinical judgments sometimes. We don't all we don't always have to use a cookbook. Um, thank you. Uh, there is one more question on the chat box from uh, Sonia. Uh, she's asking if the workup is negative, including the echo. There is no change on the. Uh, transthoracic or transesophageal echo, do you still recommend placing a loop recorder uh, for 30 to 45 days? So in patients who are, uh, you know, over, over 40, typically, yeah, even if the echo is structurally normal, we you could find AFib uh, for sure. You don't have to have an enlarged left atrium. You don't have to an elevated NT pro BMP, which we at least check in all of our patients. I don't know if everybody's doing that. Um, and and I've we found AFib, you know, meaningful amounts of AFib in those patients who don't have those those biomarkers. So I we are doing it. We're monitoring for AFib again. If it's embolic appearing and there's no other etiology, I'll definitely monitor monitor everybody for at least thirty days, regardless of the other of the other findings. If um you know if they're under forty, uh, or there's any other you know suggestion of of a atrialopathy, you know, I I would also monitor them. Uh, Dr. Papa has a comment about uh, switching to a different medication, and uh, he he commented there there is evidence in uh, changing antiplatelet uh, uh, agent make it makes sense after a stroke uh, or a particular antiplatelet agent like different maybe if the patient is on aspirin switch him to something else. No, yes, I mean, yes, thank you. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, tell me. Uh, are you are you referring to a specific study? That yeah, it's a met, it's a meta analysis I think published by Saver and some associates back in 2019 in uh, in stroke. Probably you've seen it. I think they they went through the point uh, in some other trial. So yeah, I know that some of my colleagues they they keep on doing the giving the same antiplatelet. But I also agree with you that you know maybe it's also psychological. I don't know, but uh, I I'd like to to use a different agent. 
And nowadays, uh, you know, we do, we could use also uh, Agrinox, you know. I don't know, many people don't use it anymore. And uh, that's another option, I think. And I've used it. Probably the only one, uh, you know, in the area. <laughs> but, you know, that's what it is, you know. Yeah, no, I, I, I think we used to use a lot of Agronox. We were, we were a big Agronox place. Um, but yeah, there's Ticagrelor. Uh, obviously, again, I the Compass, uh, low dose of Relto plus aspirin in the right patient. I think there's other medicines you can use. Um, I, I did want to say, so that, that I think paper you're talking about is specifically looking though at early or early after stroke. So point, you know, was uh, 90 days after stroke and switching in that period is important. And I was thinking more like long-term use, what you should, what you should be on. Uh, but I think, you know, for point, if someone comes on aspirin, it doesn't matter if they were on it or not, they, they should get dapped, right? If they fit the point criteria or chance criteria. So, so that, that I think is relatively easy because you already know you got to put them on something else. You got to put them on dapped for at least the 21 days. Um, but I think the long-term prevention is is where it's not clear if you really, can you just go back to aspirin after being on DAP for 21 days? I personally, I don't like to do it, um, but there's not clear evidence that it that it matters if you switch, but I still do it. Anyway, thank you for this comprehensive presentation. Thanks. Thank you. No, that's a great comment. I appreciate it. So what do you think, Johannes? Did we do, did we answer all the questions? Um, anybody has any questions? Um, um, I have a question. Thank you for your presentation. This is Yusuf from one of the neurology resident. Um, uh, for um, AFib, why are we not doing more ablation? We have like, I know that still the most of people still doing um, um, like great control and anticoagulation, but a lot of the studies show that rhythm control is better. We have ablation, we have now a lot of medication. And if we do that, I think we can decrease the risk of a stroke and improve the life quality. Why we don't move to that way of treatment of AFib instead just focus on the anticoagulation and the rate control? I think that's a great question, Yusuf. Um, there is evidence that ablation may, may reduce the risk of stroke. I and mean, that's the problem is all the randomized studies as I understand them for ablation, um, there's a lot of crossover and so in their primary intensive treat analysis, they have not shown a benefit for stroke prevention. It's only if you look at the as treated group where you see that there's stroke reduction. There's studies that have looked at early ablation uh, in patients who come in with AFib. Does that reduce, reduce their stroke? Maybe. I, right now, to me, it seems like a big maybe, but I agree with you that we aren't looking at that enough. Uh, and, and I think we should be uh, more so. There needs to be an appropriately powered randomized trial of AFib ablation in patients who've had a stroke for secondary stroke prevention. But, um, you know, ablation has a, it's a, it's a procedure with an upfront risk. Uh, it doesn't work about uh, a third of the time people have recurrent AFib. And um, so it's not, it's not perfect, but I, I do agree there's tantalizing evidence that it, that it could be a, a stroke prevention intervention. So great, great point. Yes, we'll have one last question in the chat box and uh, we'll wrap up. Uh, so Bernard Pudel is asking, uh, can neurocardiogenic effect of uh, post-stroke uh, syndrome uh, be a confounder for the detection of AFib? And is there a way to differentiate with uh, primary AFib or pathologic AFib, would you say? A great, great question. Uh, Michaela Rosso, uh, who you all I think know is wonderful and our, has been our fellow. Um, now for a couple of years, and she's very interested in this topic. She's published on it. And I think um, it, it isn't always easy to differentiate. Uh, I think one suggestion is that, you know, insular involvement is associated with neurocardiogenic, neurocardiogenic syndrome, and, and we see some AFib in those patients um, more so, I would say. But I, I think it's more about the burden of AFib, and, and that's what Luciano Sposato was getting to, is if you see a small amount of AFib after the stroke and then not any more beyond that point, it's probably the neurocardiogenic syndrome that, that led to that AFib. So I think if you do see some AFib early on, additional monitoring can be helpful. An implanted device would be really informative for those patients where they have a small amount of AFib early on. But if they have a significant amount of AFib after stroke, they're going to get anticoagulated. I think that's probably the right answer. So it, it's, it's a good question uh, without a great answer right now. All right. Um... Thank you so much. That was a very comprehensive, very helpful, insightful presentation. Thank you for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you all again for inviting me. And uh, Johannes, we'll be in touch. Look forward to talking to you again soon. All right. Thank you.
Same. Take care, everybody. Have a great weekend.